All right, here's the um, setup piece, and I finished the operation on it. We're going to take it out here, and we're going to put a real one in, and we're going to indicate it in. See, they go all the way through to the other side. So this is the finished setup piece. Now let me get the dial indicator in here and we're going to just check the run out just to be sure. Up by the jaws. Bring it up to a hundred thousandths. It's not too bad. And we could adjust it a little bit. Just adjusting the set through uh, screws on the chuck. Okay, that's running pretty true right there. Let's see what the end of this looks like, just for the heck of it. See how good the lathe job guy did is, he did pretty good. Running within a thousandth of an inch out here. Okay, I think we're gonna leave that alone. Good enough. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna um, index the B-axis back up to vertical or horizontal, I should say. And I'm going to uh, now put the other indicator on here. And we're just gonna double check our X and Y zero just, just for the heck of it. I'm gonna bring the machine down to zero in, in X. And I'm gonna bring it over to zero in Y. I'm looking for a magic marker here. I'm gonna mark this right here. That's where it thinks the uh, X and Y zero is right at the moment. What we're going to do, just to double check it, might be good enough the way it is, but the, the actual drawing, let me get the, in, the camera over here a little better. The actual drawing says this is data May, so we want to kind of make sure everything is true to data May. Let's see where our Right now, without rotating the part, it's pretty good. Let's just see. Because the part ran out a little bit, I'm actually rotating the indicator and the part to kind of keep where I marked it with this uh, magic marker or permanent marker, whatever you call those things. And I want to indicate it where that mark is. So that it kind of, it cancels out any run out that there is. If I, if I keep the same spot on the indicator, if you will. Okay. That's not too bad. Let's see what the display says here. The display says it was six ten thousandths off in X only. So we're gonna zero that on our work offset.
don't know if you can see that, but we're running about eight tenths and uh, a tenth of a thousandth in, in a Y, eight tenths and Z. So we're going to uh, bring the cursor down to X and we're going to teach zero, put zero over here, input, and we're going to do the same thing, teach zero, input for um, Y, go over here and hit reset, and now we're at X and Y. I don't know if you can see that with the reflection. Now we're at X and Y zero on the machine. It wasn't off that much. It, I could have probably run the part the way it was. But I just zero that just to be safe. Now I'm going to put the Hamer probe in here. And stick the indicator back on the machine. I mean, the, let me stick the camera back on the machine, I should say. I can somehow do this one-handed. I'm going to orient the spindle because I can't take, like I said before, I can't take the tool out unless I orient it. And oh, by the way, on this, let, let, let me talk about this before I take it out of there. Um, using indicators in the horizontal attitude like this, if you will, gravity comes into effect and the stylus pressure of the indicator. If you have an indicator that has a heavy spring pressure, it can affect this as well because as you rotate the around a part like this, you know, the gravity is pulling the arm down in both ways and the indicator stylus is also helping gravity push it down here and it, and it's of course helping it lift it up a little bit here. This interrapid indicator and this arm combination, I've tested it pretty extensively. This short I think this is, I don't think this is a Noga. It's, it's a, Noga makes an arm just like this. I'm not sure this one is a Noga. It might be something like an, I don't know, an incise or something, but it, it has a smaller, the Noga arm has a big old knob here on it. And, and I don't care for that. This particular, well, yeah, this one is a Noga one, but it must be an old one because the newer ones come with a big old plastic knob right here. And I, I don't really care for that. It gets in the way, and I think it might weigh a little bit more than this knob. And it's important to keep this up as short as possible and still be able to get on your part, of course. And, and uh, um, this arm needs to be very short if you're indicating in the horizontal attitude like this, or, or gravity will come into effect. If you use a big old indicator, you know, like one of these uh, mag bases, like this, one of these kind of things with the long arm and I've seen people you know they stick it on a chuck or something over here and they're trying to indicate something you know they stick it on a chuck and they try to indicate like a tail center or something on a lathe and this is inaccurate and and gravity will affect the reading and, and you'll get an off-center reading in the up and down direction the back and forth you know like in the case of this machines a y-axis not so much, but in the up and down direction, you're going to be off. And you need to, if you're going to use indicators like this, you need to test your arm and indicator combination for error before you trust it. Now, I've tested this one pretty good, and, and there's very little error. There might be a tenth or so between the up and down. So I, I basically don't worry about it. Because, and, and I try to keep it up as close as possible here. I don't want to stick it way out here like this. So this is important. And I like, see this big, huge knob? Some of these short arms from Noga come with a no, not quite that big, but a knob like that. And this, this one has the, this must be an older one, because I can't buy this anymore like this. Or I haven't been able to find it from Noga like that. I like the small, um, knob on here. Of course you could remake one and make your own and put it on on this short arm because it, it gives you more clearance. If you're if you're up like this trying to indicate a part and that big knob is here, it's going to be hitting the face of the part over here. And this smaller one is better. If you can still find that, I'm not sure. But anyway, don't use don't use these things in the horizontal direction. You'll have uh, problems. Now I'm going to stick the um, 
Hamer probe. And I'm gonna put the, I'm gonna reset the, the Z0 on this. Because these might vary in length. I mean, I didn't make the parts do the lathe work, so they may vary in length. We'll see. Well, I, I just took the setup part out, of course, and so it might be a different length than the actual. parts but I I zeroed out my indicator on the setup part here so everything's running true to the zero of this hammer this hammer indicator here so I want to bring that up to zero like that I'm gonna click and then we're gonna set the um Let's see, we're off about a one and an eight, one point eight thousandths. So let's go over here to the work offset and run it. The cursor down to Z. I'm going to teach zero input. I'm going to hit reset, and we should be at zero. So now everything should be running. True, and and like I said on the setup part, I did this exact same things, and I. And I um, adjusted my tools to get my depths correct from the face, so this should all run correct now. I'm going to do this on every part. I'm going to check the run out and, and everything and set the Z on every part just to be safe. It probably isn't totally necessary, but the depth of these, uh, the depth of these counter bores here only has like a 2,000 tolerance on it. And I don't want to have a problem. So if I zero my um, hammer on, on this, it should run consistent. So these, these are just little things that you do and you probably don't even think about doing them. I thought I'd show that. Let's take this out. All right, here's the start of the machining operation. And the first tool is just a, a spot drill to spot the holes for the um, gun drill starting drill or the pilot hole drill, I guess you might call it. And then there's four uh, 440 holes that I'm just spotting for on the face of the part here. Now I just discussed this a little bit in the um, previous video on, on the planning, kind of looking at the model and planning this job out. And um, there's eight holes going clear through the part, and then there's three other holes that are drilled at an angle later on in the program. But these eight holes, I felt like it was too much to ask of one gun. This, that's just the, the drill to drill the starting hole for the gun drills. But it was too much to ask to drill um, with one drill to drill all eight holes, because if you, um, eight inches times eight is 64 inches, so that would be quite a ways to drill in this titanium material with one gun drill. So I decided to drill halfway up or, or actually four and a quarter inches deep with the first drill, which is what you're seeing here. Now when you're gun drilling, you need to pay attention to the coolant. You can kind of see, I know it's a little difficult because the coolant is obstructing the camera a little bit, but you can kind of see how, how the coolant flows out of the drill and there's nice continuous flow of coolant and as it gets deeper in there it, it runs parallel to the drill shank and if if that changes in any way then you probably broke the tip off the off the drill and you have to stop and back it out but with a gun drill you have a chance of getting the tool out of there I've never in all the years I've been drilling with gun drills not been able to get a broken gun drill out of a hole whereas on the um, twist drills you break a twist drill in there you're pretty much stuck you, you that scraps the part or it's an EDM job this is the way the first gun drill looked after drilling all eight holes on the tip so it was doing pretty good but even still I, I wanted to use two drills and I checked it I had a program stop every two holes just to check the drill to make sure that the tip looked all right or the wear on the tip I should say now this second tool is what you're seeing here goes halfway in and then it drills all the way through or breaks through the the back of the part basically 
and that's the full eight, eight inches. So we have eight holes times eight inches, 64 inches of hole length, if you will, divided between two tools here. And this worked real good. It, I didn't have any trouble at all. I, I kind of thought I might not be able to drill all the eight holes with each drill, but it, it worked out fine and the tool showed um, acceptable wear at the end of the holes. This tool, because it's actually breaking through the back of the part, it has a little harder time on the tool than the, the first one. Anytime you break through with a drill, it, it's a little bit harder for it to do it. So that just showed after I checked it, and this is the final, I'm not showing you all the holes, I'm just showing you the first two and the final two, two of each tool. And so this is uh, the last set of the drill that's drilling all the way through, if you will. And like I say, because this drill actually breaks through, most of the time when you're drilling holes, if you watch the, if you can somehow see it when you're machining, when the tool breaks through, you see it kind of leaves a little slug or a washer like thing as it's breaking through and a lot of times that can get very hot and um, it tends to overheat the tip of the drill just for an instant and uh, that's so it's a little bit harder for a tool to break through a part than it is to drill a blind hole so you can see a little bit more wear on the tip of this drill notice the grind is slightly different too than the other tool these are factory grinds on these tools I started with Although that second grind is more like what I'll put on it when I resharpen them. Okay, so this is just milling the little, there's some little key slot things in the face of the part. So this is a 3 16 carbide end mill. Kind of a trichoidal milling uh, strategy here. Milling in, in this little key way on each side of the bore. Now this machine can't go down below in X minus more than 10 millimeters so I have to rotate the part to get both of these in there or I could position them horizontally I could have done it that way as well but I can't go down in the X minus more than 10 millimeters which would be necessary to get the bottom one on this bore so I just rotate the part 180 degrees so that's a little keyway and then this um, this tool is going to rough out there's some counter bores on the front of those gun drill holes they are 530 thousandths in diameter and they have a, a plus or minus one thousandths tolerance on it so I'm roughing them with this tool and I come back later to finish them to size they also have to have a 32 finish on them as well which really isn't a problem if you're milling them So that's that's what this is doing right here now there's going to be there's, there's a lot of coolant happening here and it's kind of hard to see it seems it seems a little bit at times in this video but I really couldn't run any of this dry so those are those counter bores roughed out right there and you can see the key slot and so you're gonna have to put up with some coolant and everything obstructing the view a little bit in these uh, video clips not much I could do about that. And this is a, a drilling, a, there's a hole behind the counter board, it's 300, 360 thousandths in diameter, and this is roughing, drilling that out. A little trouble with shavings here. Might have to work on the feed. In alum, the aluminum part, I didn't have this trouble, but in the titanium, it tends to throw up a little bit more of a stringy chip than the aluminum. I might have to work on the feed of this drill or I can just stop it like I'm doing here and clear the shavings. I don't want to get a bunch of shavings wadding up in there and obstructing the, the coolant and everything. It might have worked better if I drilled this hole before I actually went with the second gun drill. I thought about that too, so that I'd have a blind hole and it would tend to force coolant out the drilled hole more for the drill. This is a, the form tool that I described in the previous video to kind of form the hole in the bottom angle and a little bit of a radius where it transitions to the 203 thousandths hole. 
so that's what's happening here. And so I'm pretty much using the plan I discussed exactly in the previous video on when I was showing the CAD model, and, and that seemed to work out real well. This is the drill for the 440 hole, tap drill. Although we're going to mill the thread, not tap it. But it's a tap drill size. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I think this is 89 thousandths or 80 something thousandths drill. Uh, the reason I was pecking it is I didn't have a coolant through drill, and so I was pecking it to get you know the shavings out. And this is the thread mill for the 440 thread. Now I had, I'm not showing you the, every pass of this tool because it would just take up too much time on the video but I actually had a lot of little passes to get out to size and then I had about five spring passes on this tool to get it to um, gauge. In fact it didn't gauge the very first time and, and I had to rerun it which is what you're seeing there and then and I was able to get it to gauge with the thread gauge. And these kind of materials in that small thread mill, you have to have a bunch of spring passes in order to get it out to size, and sometimes that doesn't even work, and you have to hand tap the holes afterwards, particularly an ink canal that's um, necessary. Now here's the finishing tool for those uh, 530 thousandths bores. Just to bring them out to the finish size, you know, plus or minus one thousandths tolerance, 32 finish. So that's that, and I think this is the, um, or maybe I had to rerun the tool, I can't remember, yeah. I had to rerun the tool in order to get, get it to measure out to size with the, the dial board gauge. One thing that's kind of nice with these die test bore gauges is you can actually feel the finish as you run it in and out too. Tell if you have any imperfections in your finish. Oh, and the depth is a, a plus or minus one thousandths tolerance, or one and a half thousandths, I think, tolerance as well. So that has to be kind of carefully done. And here's just a chamfer. There's a, a 30 degree lead in chamfer on these holes which also has to have a 32 finish on it. Something, something's going in there like an O-ring or something and this is pretty typical of what they do on these kind of holes to get the finish to, so it doesn't um, and also to start the O-ring in there so it doesn't um, you know, cut the O-ring or something. So that's the, the end work done pretty much except for the angle holes which are coming later. But I have to do the ports on the OD of the part like I described in the video, the previous video on, on the um, showing the CAD model and the setup and the idea. So first we've got to mill a little flat. Oh, this is uh, just these spanner wrench holes. Excuse me, This do, I did this first. It's, uh, these aren't critical, they're just, I think, I think for a spanner wrench to be able to thread this into whatever it goes to with that Acme thread that's in the chuck jaws right now. And then this would be this milling a little starting flat, I believe, for that. Oh no, that, excuse me, that was a countersink. There's one of the holes has a countersink on it, and I did that with the spot drill. Same spot drill I used in the front. That's milling the flat to start this gun drill, which I described in the previous video on, on doing this first before the port that this hole goes through because of the nature of the way the hole starts down in the bottom of the port. So that's the, the pilot drill hole for the gun drill, and this is the gun drill itself. This is a, um, 
I used a hundred and six and a half thousandths diameter gun drill and this is a solid carbide gun drill and this this goes pretty good I've had good success with drilling smaller holes like this in titanium a gun drill takes longer to drill than a twist drill but it's it's more reliable and you don't have troubles with it in these kind of materials and this is just roughing out the, the there's some flat bottomed holes in here and these this I'm just roughing out one of them here this is a smaller of the two and then there's a larger drill that, that roughs out the other ones first I have to mill some counter bores or I'm um, starting places for the the bigger drill because it's this particular port is on the side of the part and then you, of course you couldn't start the drill on the on the edge of the side and the other two are just straight in shallower see I'm pointing to the holes that those were the starting points for the next drill and those two counter bores had to be in there so I just milled them at the same time So this is the drill to drill out, to rough out the flat bottom holes the little bit larger ones. I think these were, it's this tap drill size for a 3 8 24 and the other one's a tap drill size for a 5 16 24 but they're flat bottom so I have to come in with a quarter inch end mill here and kind of hard to see with the coolant but and, and mill them down to a flat square bottom. And these are also are the holes that the angled holes from the end of the part are going to intersect. You'll see that later in the video. And then, um, I'm trying to think of what this is now. Oh, this is um, finishing. One of the bores has to have a close tolerance on it. And that's what's happening here. Leave or, or we're roughing the remaining part of it. No, that was a finished cut, that's right. I'm checking it with the gauge pin there, make sure it's intolerance. And here's just spotting some little uh, spot faces because this is at a three and a half degree angle, and you, of course, just can't start the drills at that angle because they're going to walk off a little bit. So I put a little spot face. And then the first tool here is a 3 16 drill just to put a pilot hole for the gun drills to start in. Or the 3 16 gun drill. And then the, there's a tool after this, this which is a 5 30 seconds drill to put a pilot hole for one of the holes as a 5 30 seconds hole. Which is what this is doing here right now. And also I was kind of pecking on these tools as well because I didn't have coolant through drills. Uh, it's not the most, the best procedure to peck drill a carbide drill, but I do it and it works all right. So here's the 3 16 gun drill. And notice the coolant, the way it's flowing out there. You need to keep an eye on this when you're gun drilling, like I said before. And. Uh, well, in order to show you what it looks like, I had to break a gun drill, and I didn't really want to do that, but you see how it flows nice out the shank of the tool. Believe me, you'll notice a, a drastic difference if you break the, the drill and, and the coolant flows out totally different. See there, it broke into the port. These two holes break into the ports that have the um, number three SAE ports. And then there's a 5 30 seconds drill that comes next, gun drill, and it, and it goes into the port that has the number 2 SAE port. So now the um, 5 30 seconds gun drill. And what's this, what these drills are doing is feeding at a lower RPM up into the pilot hole and it, I turn the coolant on and then it drills the depth and then it comes
comes back and it turns the coolant off and slows the tool's RPM down before it pulls it out of the hole. Um, otherwise the drill could bend if you're running at full RPM. These gun drills aren't balanced or anything and, and they could just bend the tool and break the tool off. And this is just finishing this little uh, notch. That's the, the model had that in it, so I just finished it out. I didn't need it there, but showed it on the model. That was where the, originally the flat where the gun drill started the hole. This is the number two SAE port tool. Now I was running through this tool or spindle coolant although it was blowing out the collet for that tool, but this tool has kind of a step in it. And when I did that, it, it kind of blows it out to the side, so I changed the flood coolant on this tool. It got more coolant on the tool itself. So there's three holes that have a number three SA port, which is what that was, and there's only one with a number two SA port. This is the thread mill. It mills, both the threads are the same pitch, so I can use the same thread mill on both the um, number two SAE port and the number three SAE port tool. I'm not showing you all the passes of the thread mill here again. Kind of cut this up just so you know it, you can't see too much with the coolant and everything. I didn't have any trouble getting the uh, 3 8 24 thread to gauge but using the same tool for both threads there's a little bit of discrepancy in the in the I don't know the thread or something so I had to rerun this uh, 5 16 24 thread I'm gonna have to make some adjustments on the diameter of the thread in the in the cam like, uh program kind of compensate for that but then so I reran it and got it to gauge Now this is that there was a, a counter bore on the front of the 532nd gun drill hole that has a nice finish and everything. So first of all, I drill it to rough it out. And then I'm going to come back with the boring head, uh, which I showed this little bar in the in the first video on on this part. I'm going to back the head off a little bit, two thousandths of an inch, just to be safe. This boring cycle is feeding in and out. Get it to uh, gauge to a, it's a 3 sixteenths or 0 0.187 to 0.188 diameter. Here's the engraving tool for the OD, but this was very difficult to get any video at all that you could see anything. And it takes a little bit of while to do it because they specified the depth of this engraving to be 20 thousandths deep for some reason which is pretty deep for engraving to be done. What I'm using is a, a 132nd inch ball-nosed end mill. It's kind of like a die sinking end mill, so it's got a very short cut length to do this engraving and just taking like a thousandth of an inch of a pass until I get down to depth. So you can see the engraving there. So that's pretty much the whole operation on this end of the part. There's a little bit to be done on the other end, not much. And um, anyway, that, uh, that's kind of a little blurry. I know that video, but you get the idea. You can see the counter bores and the key keys on each side of the bore. So that's going to be it for this video. There should be one more video of the other end of the part when I get to it. Thanks for watching.